Next, from Memorial Medical Center in Springfield, Governor Rauner holds a press conference to announce he has officially submitted a Medicaid waiver proposal. The governor says the proposal, which requests $2.7 billion in federal Medicaid funds that would otherwise not be offered, will allow Illinois to take a holistic look at the individual and better coordinate their care across state agencies. Also speaking at the conference, Felicia Norwood, the director for the Illinois Department of Health Care and Family Services. This runs about 25 minutes. Today is a very good day, very important day for the people of Illinois. You know, when we came into office uh, early last year, it was clear we needed major change. We needed a real transformation in so many elements of our state. We're such a wonderful state, we're such wonderful people. But we needed to change things. A number of things needed to change. Our political system needed to change. Our economy needed to become more competitive so we could grow more good-paying jobs. Uh, but we really needed to transform the way government services uh, were provided. Uh, and we began that process in earnest uh, at the beginning of last year. Uh, as, as we've discussed with you in the past, we immediately set about to change our IT systems so we could become more efficient and effective. And we are well into transforming the information technology systems for our state government. We had a state government that where many departments didn't even have computers. And those that did were working in software from 1974. Um, we're changing that in a dramatic way, and we have already in, improved our state's performance on IT digital services delivered as much or more than any other state. Um, and we've gone to among the worst states uh, in America for digital services delivered to now the top third, and we want to come in the top few. We're transforming the way digital services provide more value, more productivity, a better workplace for our hardworking state employees, and more value for taxpayers. It was also clear we needed to transform our criminal justice system, a broken system, overcrowded prisons, unsafe conditions, but also unsafe communities because there was so much re re repetition, so much recidivism, uh, someone making a, a mistake and committing a crime, going to prison, coming back and repeating that cycle again and again, and often crimes that are worse every time. And prison was not helping, in fact it was training criminals to do more bad behavior. So we've begun that transformation, very proud of the bipartisan effort to do that. We've already had bills introduced, some of which have already passed. We're transforming our criminal justice system to make it more um, in, focused on rehabilitation and prevention rather than purely punishment. So we can reduce our prison population safely, but also uh, re reduce crime over on our communities and provide a safer, um, uh, system of corrections both for the officers there and the uh, offenders who are there and increase the safety for the people of Illinois. And we're very proud of that progress. In, within our state government itself across our state agencies what we found is state government was very siloed. We had different agencies and di different departments working in their own narrow purview when in reality they all touched the same person in, uh, across the uh, people of Illinois in multiple ways. And there was a very low level of coordination, cooperation, and truly effective uh, driving of services. I'm very proud of our team. Our directors, are, I think, are some of the best in America, our secretaries of our different departments and agencies. And they came together and said, we need to work collaboratively and cooperatively to drive better outcomes for the people of Illinois, deliver better services more effectively, and drive better value for taxpayers. And we've begun a, tr uh, begun a transformation of health and human services for the state of Illinois. Today, we're here to give you an update on that transformation, and particularly one of the most important elements of it, and that is in our Medicaid program, and especially around mental health services. Um, in, in Illinois and across America, mental health is often treated as a stepchild, as a separate issue from, from health, from physical health and mental health, and the reality is not separate. They're very integrated, and frankly, when we look at the challenges we have, whether it's in our correction system, whether in our education system, in all, all walks of life, mental health issues are a major driver of the challenges that we face. And we've got to think more holistically, comprehensively about how we provide mental health services. That's what we're here to talk about today. We decided to go to the federal government and request a change, a contractual change between the state of Illinois and the federal government on how we provide mental health services within the Medicaid uh, program. 
uh, that we do in a partnership, a 50-50 partnership with the federal government. We want to focus more on, on value-based outcomes. We want to focus more on prevention and early treatment. Uh, we want to focus more on keeping um, patients in the community, with their families, with, integrated with the community, rather than in large institutionalized separate settings, have more smaller settings, more community-based settings to help improve outcomes, and really focus on evidence and data rather than, than um, abstract decisions made uh, in, a, in a vacuum. And that's really what we're here to announce. We uh, came together. We had an unprecedented 12 agencies cooperate to uh, put together a request of a waiver meaning a change, a contractual change in our Medicaid program with the federal government. Uh, we sought input from thousands of stakeholders around the state of Illinois, and we responded in writing to their comments and their concerns. Um, and now we have submitted a, a, a specific waiver proposal to the federal government. We've received a very strong positive feedback from the federal government. In fact, federal leaders were encouraging our waiver application during the process, and they're giving us initial positive feedback. Still a lot of work to be done, but positive feedback. And elected officials, um, and uh, as well as various government officials around the state and in, in the federal government, have given us very positive initial feedback. Um, Cook County President Tony Preckwinkle, very supportive. In fact, she went specifically to Washington, D.C. to meet with the Democratic uh, caucus members of our, in our congressional delegation, encouraging them to support the waiver. And in fact, she got very positive feedback. Uh, from the Democratic caucus members. We've already received endorsements uh, from Senator Mark Kirk for the, for the waiver, um, Congressman Randy Holtgren, and uh, we're getting positive initial feedback from a number of the congressional Republican uh, delegation from the state of Illinois. Uh, we've received uh, positive feedback from Mayor Emanuel's administration in the city of Chicago and from another, uh, a number of other mayors. Uh, we're blessed to have a mayor here today to talk about Rockford's perspective on this. And we have the community coming together on a nonpartisan or bipartisan basis to provide better value and better outcomes in, for mental health treatment here for the people of Illinois. And with that, I'd like to turn the, the podium over uh, first, uh, well, to a number of our leaders, but first to Director Norwood uh, from our Department of um, Healthcare and Family Services and talk about this waiver process. Thanks, Director Norwood. Good morning, and thank you very much. As all of you know, the state of Illinois, through the Department of Healthcare and Family Services, is the largest insurer in the state. The Medicaid program on any day of the week has about 3.2 million individuals, one out of every four people in the state of Illinois. So we are having a crisis across not just this state, but this country. When you think about the challenges facing us with respect to behavioral health, there is not one person in this room that doesn't know someone who's been impacted by behavioral health issues. And the agency directors, as the governor said, came together in an unprecedented way to collaborate around transforming human services, first and foremost, with behavioral health. About 25 percent of Medicaid beneficiaries have some type of behavioral health issue. That's about 800,000 people in this state, and I think that's an undercount. And when you think about what we do today, we take care of individuals in a very siloed way. We have physical health issues, and then we have behavioral health issues. Well, we think it's time to change that. And this waiver is all about transforming the way that we deliver behavioral health services in this state, focusing on the integration of physical and behavioral health, what we call a whole person approach to taking care of individuals. So what are we trying to do through this process? The 1115 waiver allows you to do innovative things in a way that you can't otherwise accomplish in your Medicaid program. So this represents our opportunity to think about what health care should look like for the state of Illinois in a way that moves beyond the historical silos and think about what's the best thing for individuals, children and adults. So what we propose in this waiver are a few goals. First, let's rebalance the system that we have today, moving away from our traditional high-end institutional care and building the community-based services that we need in this state to have a full continuum. This doesn't mean that we don't need institutional care, 
but it does mean that we need to make sure that individuals are getting care at the right place, at the right time, for the right costs, and in the appropriate setting. So this waiver will allow us to rebalance our behavioral health system. Secondly, it's all about integration. And we know that today, we don't have everything that we need to make integration work. So we are proposing through this process, changing the way that we deliver Medicaid services and having a greater focus on what we call integrated health homes. Integrated health homes have been tried in other states on a very smaller fashion. We are talking about moving in a direction from a Medicaid perspective where individuals in our Medicaid program are in integrated health homes, where we are focusing on the physical and behavioral health issues with respect to those individuals. But we know that this doesn't happen without taking a look at what we call the social determinants of health. So this waiver asks for services with respect to supportive housing, and it asks for services with respect to supportive employment. Those are two critical features that are in this waiver. And as the governor mentioned, there is no juvenile justice or justice transformation without behavioral health transformation. So this waiver seeks specifically to help us do a much better job of successfully transitioning individuals from our justice system, our juvenile justice system, and Cook County Jail back into health homes in a very, very integrated way. If we don't prepare before individuals leave the juvenile justice system to have them linked with someone on the other side, we don't really improve the opportunity to reduce recidivism. So the juvenile justice piece is an important part of this waiver. In addition, we know that we spend far too much time thinking about what happens at the back end and not enough time looking at preventive services. So the waiver includes elements around home visiting services as well as what we call early childhood mental health consultation. So we are thinking about an end-to-end -end process, a continuum of services that focuses on prevention and the care that needs to be along the spectrum with respect to behavioral health. When it's all said and done, we will add some additional pieces with respect to respite care, in-home services, and the ability to step individuals down by having in place crisis beds and other mobile crisis response services to round out a comprehensive set of services for behavioral health in this state. When it's all said and done, what we are saying to the federal government is that we will spend 2% less than what we otherwise would have spent without this waiver, and we will invest that in the behavioral health system over the next five years. So between our waiver, which is one component of this strategy, in addition to that, we will be doing what we call state plan amendments. And an integral feature of this as well are technology enhancements that are necessary to make sure we have what we call a 360 degree view of a person. So we need to understand when children are in Director Sheldon's system when families are in the Department of Human Services, and when parents are in the Department of Corrections, and give us a comprehensive view of how services are being delivered and how resources are being spent in the state. Our goal is to leave no dollar on the table. And this waiver asks not for one new state general revenue dollar. What we do is leverage existing spending that we are already having today, 100% general revenue funds to allow us to draw down additional federal match. So between our waiver, which we believe will bring in $1.2 billion, and our state plan amendments, which will bring in about $1.5 billion, we will have the ability to invest in our behavioral health system over a five-year period of time, $2.7 billion without asking taxpayers for one new dollar. We think it's not only sound fiscal policy, but the best way to address the human services issues that are confronting the state of Illinois and other states as well. It's aggressive, it's bold, but it's now the time for us to really change the way that we think about healthcare in this state, and we believe the waiver will give us an opportunity to do that. We look forward to working collaboratively with the federal CMS to make this a reality. 
and we are expeditiously looking forward to their support. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to open it up for questions, um, and I'd ask let's let's focus on these issues uh, in this, and then uh, and take advantage. We've got Secretary Demas and Director Sheldon, as well as all those who've spoken here with deep expertise. We can talk about this. Very very important. Um, if most every underlying challenge we have in our various parts of our communities, mental health is a major driver, and we've got to think more strategically, comprehensively about this, and this waiver will allow us to do that and free up resources from the federal government, front end loaded, to help us transform our system. It's a very, a very exciting opportunity. And then after we talk about this in detail, I think we'll let folks get on to more productive activities and we'll, I'll talk about other topics as uh, folks would like, would like us to. Technically, Governor, what's it take to get this? Is it, an act, is it just administrative or does Congress have to get involved? I'll let someone answer. I believe it's the, the, uh, the administration, uh, the federal government, uh, the Obama administration, or I, I hope uh, we get a prompt decision and it would be the Obama administration, maybe yeah, subsequent. Who would you like to have to make the next decision? <laughs> 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 yes. Any substantial changes made to the proposal as a result of um, public hearings or anything like that, or is it relatively the I know we've got some very good feedback from thousands of sources and we responded in writing to like 200, but if somebody would like to address that. Yes, I, I would say the, the changes that were made as a result of the, uh, the public hearing process were relatively minor. Um, when you take a look at some of the things that were asked, there were changes that were asked, for example, with respect to our first episode psychosis programs. We had originally uh, limited participation in that program to individuals who had schizophrenic conditions, and the request was that we broaden that to, to allow other diagnoses. Um, to participate in that first episode psychosis program, so we decided to do that as a part of that. Originally, uh, in terms of the prevention pieces, we had um, only the dimensions around early childhood mental health consultation. We added um, later on uh, specific pieces with respect to home visiting services, focusing on uh, infants who were born with withdrawal symptoms and being able to support home visiting services for those, uh, those families. And then when we, we took a look at some other pieces of the uh, request, uh, the Department of Juvenile Justice, for example, wasn't originally included in the piece around the transition services for, our, for the justice-involved population. So we added the Department of Juvenile Justice as well into that process. So those are just three aspects, for example, that we changed as a result of the, the comment period. Director Norwood, you mentioned earlier a certain percentage of the Medicaid population has a mental health problem too, and I'm wondering if that's roughly the same percentage for the population as a whole, or if it's higher or lower <coughs> among those on Medicaid versus everybody else. I don't know what it looks like for the population as a whole. Our numbers, though, I, c I should tell you, look very similar to what you see in most other states, but I don't know what the population as a whole statistics look like from a behavioral health perspective. Well, the illnesses that are that are being addressed here, it sounds like it's more than just, you know, take a Paxil and call me in the morning. It sounds mm -hmm. like it's pretty severe stuff. What can you say about uh, the kinds of people, uh, the kinds of uh, uh, illnesses that uh, this is going to take on? It's the full range of behavioral health conditions. So it's individuals who have serious mental illnesses and uh, significant uh, issues, all the way to individuals who are exper experiencing what we call um, lower needs issues. Although, if you have the illness, for you, it's a significant issue. But it is certainly um, to address all of the range of issues. And I think from two different perspectives. On the one hand, we know that you will need psychiatrists and higher end professionals to take a look at certain conditions. But as Dr. Wolf mentioned, we know that primary care providers can take and address a lot of the lower needs issues from a, a primary care uh, perspective with the appropriate training. But this is to address the full range of issues that anyone who is in the state Medicaid program come into our program with. Can you give an example of how a case might be handled now versus under the waiver? That's an excellent point. One of the things that we did to kick off this process, we actually did what we call archetypes. So we actually took a look at how people access services as they come into our systems today and started out by trying to understand what are the pain points today 
and what goes on when a person tries to come into our system. And um, it's not pretty. It's very fragmented. Very seldom do we know whether or not we're dealing with an issue that might be with DHS or DCFS or any other part of the system. Um, and there certainly wasn't much collaboration that took place across the agencies. What this model proposes is that we use the integrated health home as a way of addressing the issues that come into to care. And it doesn't matter what door you come in, you will have a provider who is the provider to work with you as you address your physical issues and your behavioral health issues. That does not happen today at all. So the integrated health home approach, uh, certainly as Sarah mentioned, when we collaborated and spoke with the providers around what will it take to make this transformation happen, that was the highest recommendation, together with adding another set of services so you didn't have to continue to use deep end care, going to emergency rooms. So the build out of your crisis beds, step down services that allow us to help individuals address these issues in the community and giving them that health home to help them navigate healthcare. All of us know that navigating the healthcare system is pretty complex. So think about that if you have a behavioral health condition. So this model uses this integrated health home approach to be able to change the very dysfunctional way that individuals have to work across our systems today and have an integrated approach for addressing those issues going forward. What is the timeline for this, both in terms of when you expect to hear back from the federal government, and will this be an exchange of, hey, you got to fix this, and then also not just approval, but if this is to get approved, what about the rollout of this mm -hmm. actually being put to use in Illinois? So we um, submitted the waiver on Wednesday of last week, uh, Wednesday at 1.31 p.m. to be exact. <laughs> uh, we now move into a 30-day comment period with federal CMS, but while that is going on, we will plan, and I know the governor is speaking to the secretary tomorrow, but in addition to that, Secretary Demas, Director Sheldon, myself, together with the governor's office, will be making a sojourn to Washington to start to walk through this process. But as the governor said, the early feedback has been incredibly positive. CMS has been trying to push this whole issue of integrated health homes for a long period of time, so there's a lot of receptivity to that. But we will head to Washington as early as you know within this month to start working through this process. We have asked for an expeditious review of this waiver, but what we have asked for in terms of a starting date would be July 1st of 2017. A few decades ago, this was the kind of thing that if you had a, a loved one who had some kind of a mental health problem, you'd sweep it under the rug, mm -hmm. it'd be like one flew over the cuckoo's nest, we wouldn't talk about it. As, right. as a society, how and why have we come to the point where it's out in the open, <laughs> it's being treated, and it's okay to talk about it? I think a lot of groups have done a lot of great work around trying to destigmatize the conversations that we have with respect to behavioral health. Um, and I do think the whole approach to trying to integrate this, the physical and behavioral health piece, will really help to do that as well. If we think about this in the concept of the whole person, as opposed to trying to think about it in this bifurcated way that you have this mental health issue versus a physical health issue, you know, we don't stigmatize cancers or other illnesses. This is one of the things that we're trying to do through the approach to integration, but you're absolutely right. There is still enormous stigma associated with behavioral health issues, and a big part of this has to be the continued destigmatization of behavioral health. Now, I do think that the recent um, parity laws around trying to make sure that behavioral health issues are treated on a level and in parity with broader health care issues will help to do that as well. But we still have a long way to go uh, when it comes to trying to work on this issue overall. Governor, since this won't require any extra GRF in the state, how clutch of a move is this as far as trying to maintain and improve the state's finances as it as appeals to health, mental health care? Well, um, this is a transformative event. What this allows us to do is access over five years, $2.7 billion incremental from the federal government. And it's going to be mostly front end loaded. So that will allow us to fund restructuring of the way we're providing our mental health services and integrate it with our physical health services and change some of the settings um, and the, the stage at which these services are being provided. Big change. And the goal is 
both for the federal government and for ourselves, for this to save significant money in years three, four, five, and beyond. Save significant money. So, um, because the, the federal government's, w one of the key things they use to approve the waiver is to look at, is it realistic for us to spend $2.7 billion on the front end of five years and have it be budget neutral for the federal government? That's one of their goals. We believe that we've made the case that it will be budget neutral, and that means basically saving the state money while keeping the federal government neutral. It's a, it's a very big, powerful change.